Can you try again? Oops. Mm. Okay. Maybe we can start now. So hello, everyone. Uh, let's start our dark matter detection session now. So first, I would like to welcome all of the speakers and uh, participants to attend this uh, session. We will have uh, totally two sessions uh, with a short break between them. Uh, for the first uh, session, uh, each speaker will have uh, 12 minutes to uh, show your slides. And then we will have two minutes to discuss. So the first, uh, the first talk is coming from the SNOW uh, Super CDMS uh, collaboration. The Sorry. Was, uh, yeah, Palio, we can test uh, uh, later, just after the first talk. OK? Sure. Yeah, OK. So the, the first speaker is uh, Tarek Seb from uh, Super CDMS uh, Collaboration. And uh, the title is uh, Super CDMS Snow Lab Experiment, Mining the Matter in Northern Canada. So please, Tarek. Thank you. Let me go full screen. All right, so I um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, present uh, at this venue. I've been looking forward to it. Uh, for a month. So I will tell you today a little bit about the dark matter search program that we are undertaking uh, as part of the super CDMS experiment at, at specifically aimed at the snow lab site. Here we go. So the, the talk, I will briefly, very briefly touch upon the principles of dark matter detection and how once you have an idea of how the, such a particle would interact, how would you then design a detector in, uh, that would be capable of observing such events uh, when they do occur? And then I will dive into the details of the implementation uh, taken by Super CDMS and where things stand and where we hope to be in the near future. So this is a photograph of the CDMS collaboration where uh, a group of over a hundred scientists from across two dozen institutions around the world. And so this photo was taken at a time when you can't have this many people in, in such close proximity to each other. Hopefully we'll be back at this position soon. So given the, if, if you accept the idea that dark matter exists as a particle, and you look at the very theoretical models that are proposed to explain it, how would you expect this particle to interact with regular matter? Based on the mass and sort of the interaction type of the particle, there are kind of three categories where one might look for interaction to happen. For the traditional WIMPs, uh, i.e. also the massive uh, kind of dark matter candidates, Interactions are predominantly expected to occur via nuclear recalls. So the interaction will happen with the atomic nucleus. Um, and very few other types of particles interact that way. The two predominant kind, uh, other kinds would be neutrons and, and neutrinos. Um, as you go towards slightly to lighter candidates or different interaction mechanisms, then a dark matter particle can also interact directly with the atomic electrons. Uh, and that changes the situation a bit. It changes what, what happens in the detector, but also changes the population of backgrounds that you are sensitive to and that you're you know, concerned about controlling. And sort of in the extreme, when the, the dark matter candidate is very light or the interaction uh, energy transfer is very low, there is a possibility that it actually will be interacting directly with excitations in the bulk medium. So with either phonons in a solid or Cooper pairs in a superconductor. And so the response that you see in the detector will be different depending on which type of recoil is taking place. And so you have to design and tailor 
a technique appropriate for each uh, scenario. To kind of highlight the effect of the dark matter particle mass on how you go search about it, here I show uh, in this plot what the maximum recall energy the dark matter particle can transfer to a detector atom as a function of its mass. And for a long time, you know, the detection community has been searching up here in this top corner. So heavy dark matter particles, the transferred energies on the order of keV, much larger than the atomic scale. So you can think of it as just a dark matter interacting with the particle. And basically, we use a lot of particle physics techniques to pursue these searches. As you extend the search to lighter and lighter particles, the maximum transfer energy drops. And now you enter a regime, and you know, this is where the field is sort of starting to expand in this area, where the transferred energy is on the scale of the atomic energies, or, or sort of the, the scale of the uh, excitation energies in, in say, um, a medium. And so all of a sudden, we find ourselves having to learn condensed matter physics as well to try to think about how one might pursue these searches. And sort of the challenges faced in terms of designing the experiment, not just in terms of the detector, but uh, the amount, the, the sensitivity to background and how long you need to operate it is certainly strongly dependent on what type of dark matter you're trying to look for. So, how do we attempt this within the context of the super CDMS experiment? In this diagram, I show you what, uh, what one of our detectors look like. Uh, we basically use crystals of silicon and germanium. And I'll be talking about two kinds of detectors in this talk uh, that I kind of labeled discriminating detectors and low threshold detectors. Um, but they're really the same type. The only difference between the two is uh, the ap applied, the magnitude of the applied electric field. And, and I'll explain why very briefly. But first, let me say what happens in this device when an interaction occurs, whether it's from a dark matter particle or something else. The interaction, the deposit energy will create a population of electron and holes, as well as a population of phonons. And you can measure both of them. So the electric field will cause the holes and electrons to drift. By measuring both of these populations, you can determine not only the total energy of the event, but what kind of recoil it was, whether it was a nuclear or electron recoil. And that's why I refer to this as a discriminating device. Now, if you increase the electric field, uh, what happens is the drifting charges they're doing, or the electric field is doing work on them, and that work will get exhibited in the detector as an increased emission of phonons. So you end up amplifying your signal quite a bit. What that gains is it allows you to probe lower energies. So you lower your uh, search region quite a bit. But this process, unfortunately, you give up the ability to distinguish between electron and nuclear recoil with it. So uh, you, you gain in one area, you lose in another. This is a picture of what these devices look like. They're cylinders about four inches by one in diameter by one inch thick, made of silicon and germanium. So the mass of each is about half a kilogram for silicon, one and a half for germanium. They are cooled in a dilution refrigerator to 15 millikelvin and operated um, you know, uh, underground. The initial payload of the Snow Lab experiment will consist of 24 such detectors. So they'll be grouped into four towers of six each, with half of them being the IZIP or the discriminating detector type, and half of them being the low threshold type. So let me show you what the difference between the two types is in action. If we focus on the right-hand side, we see the discriminating detector. This plot shows us in, this, in, in a scatter plot in two dimensions, one being the recoil energy and the other this quantity called ionization yield. And if we focus on these blue events, these are 
electron recalls occurring in the bulk of the detector. And this green line here indicates where nuclear recalls or dark matter interactions would occur. And so you can see that with, with the statistics here, oh, there is no blue event that appears down in the green band. So that indicates how well you're able to distinguish background from signal. But you can also see as the energy goes lower and lower down to roughly 10 or 5 keV, you start losing this ability as the two populations kind of merge into each other. And that is where the low threshold detectors kick in. And here you can see an energy spectrum taken from one of them, like we start at 10 keV, and it can extend all the way down to uh, less than 100 eV. In fact, the threshold has been achieved is 50. And that allows you to search for lower mass particles. I'm going to skip this uh, due to time and just say that in order to go even lower in mass, you have to somehow find a way to lower the threshold. And one way to do that is to actually use smaller detectors because the energy resolution decreases or improves as the size of the detector gets smaller. So here is a one gram you know, compared to the one kilogram type device. And it's able to achieve a resolution of, uh, well, originally 14 EV, the next iteration was down to three. This means it can observe and count individual electron hole pairs, as you can see in the spectrum. And that makes dark matter searches, actually, it enables a class of searches that were previously not possible and allows you to extend the mass to significantly lower regime. So if we put all of this together, I'll very briefly go through this. It shows you the type, the technique that we use and the mass range that you're able to probe. And so the large detectors are able to probe regions above one GeV and then um, by applying the high voltage, you lose background discrimination, but you're able to probe electron recall interactions down to one MeV. And then uh, beyond that, you, the channel that you can probe is inelastic or direct absorption of say a dark photon or an axion-like particle all the way down to an EV scale, which is the band gap in silicon. So super CDMS experiments should be able to probe dark matter parameter space over almost 12 orders of magnitude in mass. Uh, the Snow Lab experiment we're currently building at is in Sudbury, Canada. It's two kilometers underground. What that buys you is a lot of shielding from cosmic ray muons. And it's a very clean room facility. So, you know, control and suppression of backgrounds. This is a schematic of what the experiment will look like. So here is where the super CDMS detectors will live and the green cylinder is basically what the shielding surrounding the de detectors look like. Uh, that's a schematic, I will just uh, go through it quickly. All right, so where do things stand in terms of results? I talked about the different mass scales. And here I will start with the lowest mass scales, specifically dark photon searches. You can see this blue curve on the, on the left-hand side, that's a super CDMS result. Uh, along with other curves taken with silicon detectors by Damic and Sensei experiments. And they are able to kind of carve out a region of parameter space below uh, 10 electron volts. At higher masses, you can see liquid xenon detectors become competitive and are able to carve down to lower cross sections or mixing angles in, in this particular case. Moving up the mass scale to MEV devices, you see that the pattern repeats itself. Silicon or crystal-based detectors are able to probe down the lowest masses and liquid uh, xenon detectors are able then uh, to probe lower at higher masses. And you can see in this case, experiments are able to also reach benchmark theoretical models. And soon you can see that they will reach the neutrino, it's called the neutrino discovery limit where neutrinos become a significant background to improving the experimental reach. And finally, at the highest mass scales for you know, GEV scale devices, there's a lot of experiments operating in this area. I'm not gonna show every single curve, but you can see all the solid curves are actual experimental results. So these are regions of parameter space that has been ruled out. And I wanna highlight the dashed curve and sort of the orange area here is where we expect the super CDMS snow lab experiment, the first payload of 
24 detectors to be able to reach down. And so in the region from say a half of a GeV to 10 GeV, we should come, expect to come very close to the, again, similar the neutrino limit where neutrinos become a very significant background. If you're interested, I should say uh, at the CDMS website, we have this limit plotter. You so can Eric, yes. you have uh, one minute. Yes, th this, is, this is my final slide. Okay. Uh, so, so people are welcome to download this and, and, and explore. So I will just end by saying that the Super CDMS uh, program is uh, designed to search for dark matter down or very close to the neutrino floor in sort of the one to 10 GeV mass range. We're taking this technology and expanding it to smaller detectors that allow us to reach to much lower masses. The experiment is currently being assembled. We hope to begin installation sometime next year and begin taking data in, in, in late 2022. And I will just stop on this one last slide here. There are many okay. phenomena in physics that took a long while to discover. Hopefully dark matter can be crossed off this list soon. Thank yeah, you. okay, thank you. Thank you, Eric, for the nice talk. And uh, questions? So, so can I have a question, quick question? Yes. So, yeah, can you distinguish the signal from, for example, the dark photon or the electron recoil? No. So, in both cases, uh, you, what the 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 what happens in the detector is the energy gets transferred to an electron, uh, and therefore, all the subsequent processes are identical. And so what happens is whether it's a dark photon or a Compton scatter is it will be an event that appears in one of these peaks here. I, I don't know if you can see where my mouse is pointing. So on an event by event basis, you cannot distinguish, but this is where we leverage our knowledge of the uh, expected spectral shape of the two types and, and, and try to set the limit based on that. Okay, so Pedro? Yeah. Do you have a uh, question? Yes, just a curiosity. Mm -hmm. You mentioned here that you plan to push the energy resolution as low as three electron volt. This, how, how do you convert this into trash energy threshold for your events? Well, so, so, so the three electron volt is, is actually a device that was built and operated. So we, we, we have taken data with this resolution. Uh, and so you can see in the spectrum here, um, uh, we're able to observe this, uh, the first one electron hole peak. Uh, so the threshold is, is get set at which point do you start seeing events that correspond to uh, to, to basically zero electron hole peaks or, or incomplete charges drifting across the crystal. So uh, in a sense, th that is determined by what we observe or, but I mean, from an experiment detector point of view, it is really determined by leakage current that you see in the detector that can give you events that fall in between the peaks a little bit. Okay, thank you. We have to move on. And uh, thank you, Tarek. Bye bye. Right. Thanks. Yeah. So the second talk is uh, from uh, Palio. Now you can share your screen. The title is uh, Search of La uh, Light Dark Matter with the Crest 3 Experiment. Yes. You can see my screen now, right? Yes, we can see. Okay, you can use the full screen. Now you should see the full screen. Yes, correct. Please start. 
So 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. So yes, this is just a short uh, report on the search for light dark matter with the Crest experiment. And this is uh, just a recent uh, picture of the Crest collaboration in one of our online meeting. And Crest is a collaboration uh, mainly of uh, European institution, uh, Germany, Italy, Austria, and other small collaboration from around Europe. And uh, Crest is located at Laboratori Nazionale di Gran Sasso in Italy. And here you see just a nice picture of the Gran Sasso mountain and a sketch of the lab underground inside the mountain. And This is the installation of uh, Crest in the old A of the laboratory at Gran Sasso, the, the hut where the Crest cryostat is hosted. And this is the, uh, how the experiment looked like. Uh, the goal of Crest is direct detection of dark matter via scattering of nuclei in cryogenic detectors. So this is how the one recent uh, array looked like during the installation phase. And this is the uh, module of uh, one of our detector with the calcium tungstate crystals. And uh, the idea of this detector is uh, uh, very simple. These are cryogenic detectors. So this, you have a, an absorber crystal, which is weakly linked to a, a heat bath. And when an interaction happens in the crystal, you have a temperature rise that you can eventually measure with the a sensitive thermometer and this temperature rise uh, is proportional to the released energy and inversely proportional to the heat capacity. And the sensor that we use, our transition edge sensor, these uh, are basically superconducting films, tungsten films in which uh, you position, you tune the temperature of your detector on the superconducting transition. And in this uh, region you get uh, a very large resistance variation corresponding to a very small temperature variation, which is a very small energy release. And uh, uh, these are read through squid readout system. And uh, in particular, right now, Crest is using calcium tungstate crystal, which have the property of being uh, uh, scintillating crystals. So you get uh, uh, basically a coincident signal of uh, uh, phonon, which collects most of the release energy and provide the information about the deposited energy and scintillation light, which allows uh, a, uh, in some way particle identification. So this is uh, uh, one crest module with the calcium tank state crystal that uh, uh, collects the interaction and emits the light and a second uh, uh, cryogenic detector, which is uh, a sapphire crystal which uh, collects the light and reading simultaneously the two uh, energies allows uh, for the identification of the energy and of the particle and you can define a light yield which then you can plot in an energy versus light yield plane and identify uh, nuclear recoils and even uh, nuclear recoils on different uh, elements composing the calcium tungstate crystal with respect to alpha or beta gamma radiation. So this is how this looks in reality. This is a real a neutron calibration. And you see that you can have the maximum of the coupling of the neutrons with the oxygen and you will separate the uh, electron gamma band. So in recent years, what we call the CREST three phase of the experiment, detectors were um, tuned to explore light dark matter. So the mass of the crystal was reduced to 24 grams to reduce the heat capacity and improve, improve the response. And uh, thanks to this uh, uh, configuration, this is just uh, a, a picture of uh, the number of parts that are needed to build one of such modules. We were able to push our sensitivity as low as uh, uh, 30 electron volts in 
in threshold and uh, this uh, allowed to explore regions of the uh, parameter space we were never explored uh, before. So, uh, of course, once you produce this uh, events, you have to go through all the uh, analysis chain and this you implies the, the use of selection criteria. So keep uh, only events with the correct determination of the energy. And we went through this uh, uh, blind analysis. So we set the, the cuts on our data set through a, what we call the training set, which is a 20% of the data randomly extracted from the main set, which doesn't allow uh, biasing on the dark matter region and then apply the cuts to the full blind data set. And then there are the usual cuts on rate, stability, data quality, and, and coincidence with muon veto and other detectors. And what you get at this point is a reduction of the, what you see plotted here is the full number of events and uh, the events that survive uh, uh, the cuts. And also the fit of the rise is what allows you to reconstruct your energy threshold. So once you have done all the cuts, you can look into the real data and this is how they look like. So we optimize the analysis in this very low energy region. So below 16 keV. And we were able to check our calibration through this cosmogenic activation lines. Uh, we uh, provided these two X-rays uh, in the in the region of interest. So once you have done all of this, you can look into the uh, region of interest, which is set between the fifty percent of the oxygen band down to the. 99% of the tungsten band, and then you can select the events that gets into this, uh, this uh, uh, acceptant region. And once you've done this, you can uh, extract a dark matter limit. This was done with the Yellin one dimensional method, and uh, you end up with this uh, exclusion plot. So what you get here is uh, an improvement with respect to uh, previous crest uh, result at about 0.5 GeV of some one order of magnitude. And also we extended the range of exploration in the parameter space uh, as low as uh, 160 MeV. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we, we have uh, a leading sensitivity in this, uh, in this energy region, but we face the fact that this result is limited by the uh, uh, rise of events of counts in the very low energy region below 100 or 200 of uh, electron volts. So uh, basically we started exploring a region where we have never been before and we see a background that was never observed before. So we are entering that room and we don't know whether it's in, in the other side. And this is how the event rise look like. So uh, the analysis of this uh, phenomena show that the energy rise, even though it's observed in different uh, detectors have uh, different shapes in different detectors and different energy, starting at different energy. So. Basically, this uh, excludes a common origin of this rise in the different detectors. And we started a strong um, experimental campaign to try to pinpoint the origin of this, uh, of this events uh, through selecting the different materials or components of the crest detectors. And so in the last uh, two years, with some difficulty generated by the global pandemic, we uh, started a strong uh, campaign with uh, dedicated models to test, uh, to pinpoint a different uh, part. And this, this run is currently ongoing and we collected uh, 
most of the data that we wanted to collect in blind exposure, and we are now ready to a final neutron calibration, and then we will unblind the data and look into the uh, possible result. The good uh, thing of this data is that the performance are very good, even probably better than the 30 electron volt I showed in this talk. And this is very promising for better understanding what is going on. So the CREST program in the next uh, few years will be going through this identification of, uh, of the low energy rise and background and then proceed with the upgrade to 288 channels. So to about a hundred modules. And this will allow to improve not only the uh, energy threshold, but also the exposure to go deeply into the uh, parameter space. So basically this is my last slide. We are on the, on the edge of a new uh, frontier of exploration because we are looking into a region where no one has, has ever looked before. And many of the process we observe in this region, we don't know what they're generated from. So it's, it's really a new challenge and we are going on with that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your nice talk. And uh, you have uh, saved almost uh, half minutes. So now questions. So I have a question. Uh, so you say you will have uh, a plan to set up a, a, a system detector system with 288 detectors, channels. That means uh, 288 detectors? This means basically uh, 100 models, roughly 90. Okay. Uh, something as you can see here, so you, what you see here, we have uh, um, basically three readout channel, the oh, main okay. yeah. detector, the light detector, and then what we call this eye sticks that are supports that are read in parallel. So basically you have two, two, three readout channels per, per module that allow the full active readout and the rejection of all the contaminations. Okay. That means you will keep the, proto the, the mass of the prototype detector to be uh, something like 24 gram, will not go smaller to get this a is, lower energy threshold. This is, this is a good point. We actually uh, believe that the best way to get uh, to even uh, lower um, threshold is optimizing the the sensor. So we are testing also lower mass. We already provide uh, one uh, uh, measurement with a one gram detector. What you see up here, this dash the uh, red line is a prototype of one gram operated above ground. And this show that potentially you can improve the threshold but paying on the side of exposure. But with the optimization of the transition edge sensor, we believe we can reach similar performance uh, saving the mass. Okay. Okay, thank you. So any questions? So if no questions, uh, Let's thank speakers, thanks Paula, again for his talk. Okay, now let's move on. The next speaker is uh, Xin De Ling from uh, Sichuan University. And the title of his talk is uh, the matter program of the CDX collaboration at the CJTL. So please, Xin De. So, uh, can you see the screen? Sorry, I yes. got a bit mess. Okay, uh, okay thanks for organizer for giving me the opportunity to deliver a talk here. And I'm on behalf of CJX collaboration. 
So in this talk, I will give you an overview of our programs and uh, collaboration, highlight on our recent uh, results on WIMS and uh, non-WIMS type uh, dot meta models. Uh, uh, as you can see the various of uh, uh, meta models. And uh, I would like to draw you uh, attention on the new um, meta programs of CDEX uh, 50 Dometa and performed, uh, will be performed at CJPL2 for the new site. And the consequence, uh, sorry, uh, the corresponding of uh, R&D programs on the key domain technologies and the background controls will be discussed. For, uh, and eventually I will give the summary and uh, the perspective of our programs. So uh, uh, what, who are we? So uh, we are from the, uh, China, uh, mainly from the, the uh, around Hong, hundreds of uh, uh, people and uh, most are uh, from the China uh, Institute and together with the Tesano group. So um, so what uh, we are doing is uh, we perform the light dark matter as well as the uh, low recoil um, uh, standard uh, uh, non-wind type uh, dark matter models uh, with the array of germanium detectors. And uh, the, the matter uh, uh, people here uh, got the very familiar that the uh, wind comes and hit the, hit the nuclear and nuclear move and we take a picture. So uh, it's quite straightforward. And uh, uh, we also look for the annual modulations of the WIMS uh, uh, sig signatures. And here is our data meta stage, stage, stage of CDEX collaboration. Uh, we start from the CDEX uh, one with the uh, modular uh, one kilogram germanium detector prototypes. And we, uh, uh, we try to uh, uh, understand the performance and uh, the, the background uh, understanding of this uh, site and the, as well as the detectors. And CDS 10 is allow us to okay, use the, an array of domain detectors uh, perform in such uh, uh, one uh, promising underground site. And the CDS 10, uh, we start to uh, uh, the homemade uh, uh, technologies, especially for fabrication of germanium uh, crystal growing and very front end uh, and very low background uh, materials and uh, electronics. So um, the the new programs uh, uh, it proposed here is a CDEX 50 matter, which combined the bare germanium detectors immune in uh, possibly in uh, liquid nitrogen as well as the liquid argon technologies and uh, together with the low radioactivity technology, the purpose is to achieve the lowering the structure and reduce the background. So uh, here is the China Jinping underground site location and it located in uh, Sichuan province, China. And uh, our laboratory is in the middle of the uh, 17 kilograms uh, uh, tunnel over burden for around uh, 2,400 meter rock. So the best uh, allocation of the CZPL1. So here is the first appearance and uh, 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 can give it everybody a scale, uh, which have the 40 meter times 60 meter times, sorry, six meter times six meter. So basically um, it has been full by the two diameter experiment, which is the Panda X and Sigdex, some low background facility, as well as some uh, prototype uh, experiments. 
So here is for CDEX collaboration, and uh, um, this one is the the the, the schematic diagram of this p tide germanium uh, is shown here, and uh, the crystal is uh, cooled by the cold finger, and uh, the shooting from the inside from out uh, cover encroaches tightly with the very clean materials, and uh, this is the best line uh, we perform for the CTS one at CZPO one site. So you will see this basic uh, idea, best night design. And this the uh, results for CDEX one uh, include the two types of uh, germanium detector. Uh, first of all, with the okay, um, uh, uh, with the the that's one with the uh, quite flat background, and uh, for the CDEX one uh, B, which is improved the structure from the around uh, 400 something EV uh, down to the 160 EV to allow us to uh, open the new uh, detection channels. And uh, according to the stability of the CDEX 1B, we are allowed to uh, analysis the annual modulation results. So here is the uh, here is our results for explore the new uh, uh, annual modulation uh, detection channel, uh, especially below to six uh, GeV. So and uh, uh, this I uh, this uh, published in in uh, within PIL with our re result as well as our sub GeV uh, uh, pro Win Pro via the uh, metadata effect, and uh, it also give us the, uh, uh, due to the low benefit of the low threshold and uh, uh, they have a, a better uh, sensitivity below the uh, uh, tens of MeV to 100 MeV scale sensitivities. Okay, uh, besides the WEM, uh, we also search the non WEM tight uh, diameter models via this uh, CDS1, include the uh, solar axion search with the um, mono energetic uh, fo uh, photon from the M1 sub transition from uh, I IN57 uh, from the so solar core, as well as the, we can okay, uh, uh, test the coupling constant as a function of mass. And we also search the axion light diameter, vector bosonic diameter as well. And the CTS-10 is trying to combine the, the germanium array in a liquid nitrogen cryogenic system. And uh, that's the okay search for uh, physics result from CTS-10 and uh, we reached a very nice uh, fresh spectrum, uh, even till the 160 EV, and uh, uh, it's allowed us to okay uh, perform the lower uh, dark photon region as well as we have the uh, effective field theory operators for 16 different operators search. And the new uh, experiment for CDEX uh, uh, 50 diameter experiment uh, were performed at the new site of CZPL. And uh, the idea is uh, using the rare germanium detector immune in liquid nitrogen or liquid argon directly. And the plan is, okay, uh, assign the seven streams consist each one uh, uh, beige and on top and seven point contact germanium detector in the, in the following and contributing the 50 kilogram. And the purpose uh, to pro the region is trying to uh, cover the, the region belong to uh, 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 a GEV region at the uh, above, uh, just slightly above the, the, the neutrino flow. 
So how to okay, achieve this the background control for the CDES 50 diameter uh, study. So uh, we have the construction of su supporting materials, but uh, quite rare due to using the, the liquid nitrogen, huge li liquid nitrogen tank. So we have an uh, intrinsic contamination in detector, which is severe. So for the tricyan and the, the various isotopes, and uh, uh, the one uh, we face is the liquid nitrogen uh, also have the, uh, although rare, but uh, still do have the ray down contamination. So uh, we are working on that. And uh, for the surface uh, uh, effect, uh, not only for the uh, alpha beta particles, as well as the box surface discrimination uh, would be the challenge for our low threshold. And this is the background modeling for CTS 50 uh, diameter. And uh, we can see that this preliminary result for, for the background budget uh, mainly come from uh, the, 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 the tricyan, which is the intrinsic background of the germanium. So uh, we have a very um, uh, uh, sophistic sophisticated to control the plan to control the ground time exposure, uh, including the detector pro uh, production, shipping, and the storage. So this is the R&D part for key germanium uh, technology uh, to achieve the very uh, challenge for the CDEX 50 diameter programs. So uh, uh, we have a various type of uh, germanium uh, fabrication for p tie and the point counter, pregnant coil and has already success for uh, 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 for home mat uh, around uh, twenty detectors, and then we have uh, trying to, uh, still ongoing programs for the uh, germanium crystal growing, as well as the ultra low background uh, front end uh, part include the ASIC. Uh, power and uh, silicon substrate, and uh, you uh, you may see the previous one silicon substrate also dominate uh, second dominate for the background and the PTFE for the electronics. Uh, we also okay stuff for the electrophone co copper production in underground site, and the goal is trying to reach this uh, contamination level. And uh, this one is coupled with our uh, neutrino double bar decay uh, program, which I would not uh, pay, pay attention on this part. And then we also successed to perform the bare germanium immune in liquid nitrogen. So here is my alumni missing energy density problem. So very interesting and important one in our basic size and the results of the light winds and the non winds type model searches has been carried out uh, at our CJPL1 and the coming programs for CDX50 diameter uh, would be performed at the new site of Germany, uh, sorry, CJPL background modeling and uh, the reduction is established. So uh, our R&D program is focusing on the key germanium technology as well as the low radioactivity uh, tech, uh, techniques and trying to reach our goal. And uh, also the CJPL2 is the new facility and uh, hopefully the com uh, will benefit for, for the global community for searching the diameter and the neutrino experiments. And uh, we are hoping the international com uh, community to support and explore or think hard for these golden opportunities. And that's my talk, thank you. Okay, thank you, Xingde. So any questions or comments? So if no questions and comments, let's uh, move on. Thank you, Xingde. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. So now thank I you. want to pass 
my host to the Hongjian. Now, Hongjian, you are the chairs. Okay, thank you. You and the Yuan Qiang are the chairs. Okay. Okay, so let's move on. So our next speaker is Dr. Jia Mingzhen from SJTU. And his title is explaining the recent uh, zero one time space uh, with me, me last about it. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So can you hear me and can you see the slide? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm very happy to have the opportunity to present our work in this great conference. Um, so my talk will be on inelastic dark matter and its explanation um, for the recent xenon one-time excess. And this work was done with Professor He and his uh, student Yu Cheng Wang. Yu Cheng Wang is recently um, also a postdoc of uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So here is a brief summary of my talk. I will show that the exothermic inelastic dark matter has very distinct uh, electron recall signal um, from the uh, traditional elastic dark matter scenario. And it can fit the xenon one time excess pretty well. We studied this scenario with effective operators with, uh, and constrained them with dark matter radic abundance, direct detection rates, dark matter lifetime, et cetera. And finally, I will also mention some possible UV completions of these um, effective operators and of these scenarios. So let me briefly review the um, xenon one time excess. So last year, um, the xenon collaboration reported a 3.5 sigma excess of electron recoil events at energy around um, 2.3 keV, so which is this bump here. There are um, a lot of probable explanations to this excess. It might be just due to the cheating background that was not identified in the setup of the experiment, or it might be due to beyond the standard model physics, such as dark matter, solar axions, um, solar neutrino, magnetic moment, et cetera. So the Panda X collaboration also looked at the same energy range. And due to the same tritium background, they were, they were not able to um, either um, confirm or disprove the new physics uh, explanation of the um, xenon one time excess. But um, the interesting aspect for the, of the xenon one time excess in the uh, model building point of view is that um, the traditional elastic recoil actually cannot explain the xenon one time excess. This can be seen uh, from this um, very simple question of energy momentum conservation in one dimension. We find that the um, recoil energy is always bounded by the smaller one of the mass of the electron or the dark matter. And it is also bounded by the low velocity of the local dark matter and the velocity of the electron in the detector. So eventually the uh, recoil energy must be smaller than uh, 0 0.05 keV, which is surely not enough to explain the xenon one time excess. The only exception being that um, the boosted, the so-called boosted dark matter scenario where it is assumed that um, the dark matter might has a um, boosted uh, faster velocity component near Earth, but we will not dive into this possibility. So the scenario we are considering is the so-called exothermic inelastic dark matter. So it is pretty natural to think that um, the dark matter actually make up of more than one component. And the scenario we have in mind is a two component dark matter scenario um, with each of them uh, having the same amount. And one of them is slightly heavier than the other one. We call the heavier one X prime and the lighter one X. And because of the argument I showed in the last slide, 
the elastic scattering as well as the upscattering of the lighter component to the heavier component is suppressed by the low local dark matter velocity. And only the downscattering of the heavier component can happen in the detector. And the mass gap energy um, of these um, heavier dark matter will, will be mostly injected into the um, electron and results in a peak or uh, in the um, electron recoil spectrum um, at the position of the mass gap. So um, we can see that um, this scenario actually fits the xenon one time excess pretty well. And we have also performed a chi-square fit. Um, and we find that the mass gap of this scenario have to lie in between two and three keV. And the um, cross-section over mass should be of order 10 to the minus 43 centimeters squared per GeV. So although the xenon one ton um, only determines the reaction rate um, of this inelastic scattering, it actually has a lot of interesting um, cosmological implications. So first of all, by um, closing the electron loop in this vertex and by attaching some photons to this electron loop, we find that um, the um, heavier component would inevitably decay to the lighter component plus some photons or neutrinos. And we need to worry about whether the um, heavier components survive long enough to um, scatter with the electrons in the detector. Um, the second concern is that um, this interaction also converts um, the two components into each other um, in the early universe. And we might need to worry about their ratio today. Um, but fortunately, um, this process decouples in the early universe when the temperature is slightly lower than the mass of the electron and much larger than the mass gap. So that this ratio is actually frozen at equality in the early universe. And finally, um, by crossing this interaction, we get an annihilation um, process and, um, it and it indeed affects the relic density here. So to study the correlation between all of these effects, um, we use an effective field theory approach so that the result of our analysis is mostly model independent. To begin with, uh, we consider the simplest case of scalar dark matter plus dimension six operators and we found that uh, even if we consider the most general case, um, all the other operators that induces inelastic scattering is actually equivalent to one of these three operators plus negligible terms based on um, equation of motion. Um, the first one is just a scalar contact interaction. And the second and the third one is a vector interaction that couples to the left-handed lepton doublet or just the right-handed lepton. So the first thing we check is the uh, combination between the xenon one ton excess rate with the relic density. We found that um, in both cases, the dark matter mass must um, be around um, the order one GeV. And for the scalar contact interaction, um, the cutoff scale must be around one TeV, and for the vector for both of the vector um, type interaction, the cutoff must be around one hundred GeV. So um, the x prime lifetime, um, that is the lifetime of the heavier component, might be a bigger concern because for the vector interaction that couples to the left-handed fermion. Um, so if the dark matter couples with the left-handed electron, then by the SU2L symmetry of the standard model, it means it also has to couple to left-handed neutrinos. This unfortunately implies that the uh, X prime with decays to X plus two um, neutrinos uh, 
at the tree level. And the requirement for the X prime lifetime would, uh, would need the cutoff of this interaction to be larger than 300 GeV, which um, surely contradicts the 100 GeV requirement from direct detection plus relic density. So um, the lesson we learned here is that the vector portal to the left-handed uh, lepton doublet cannot explain the xenon one-time excess. However, it might be interesting for future direct detections that are sensitive to lower recoil energy, uh, namely lower delta M and um, lower event rates, namely larger uh, cut-up scales. Um, the lifetime is less of an issue for the other two operators because um, these operators do not couple dark matter to the um, left-handed neutrinos. And the dominant decay channel in this case um, is the um, two photon decay, um, which is obtained by closing the electron loop um, from this effective operator and then uh, by attaching two photons to the electron loop. So uh, this loop um, induces more um, suppressions um, due to the extra powers of uh, mass gap over dark matter mass and mass gap over uh, electron mass um, in the decay rates. And, and eventually, it will render the lifetime of the heavier component much larger than the age of the universe by um, several orders of magnitude. So we have seen that um, there are two surviving operators. And the next question to ask is whether they can be actually UV completed, because we know that um, usually UV completions uh, face more constraints than um, effective operators. And um, actually, we found that um, these operators can have rather simple UV completions. So for the scalar contact interaction, it can be mediated via heavy Higgs portal, namely if the, um, left if the leptons and the dark matter both couple to um, heavy Higgs doublet, then by integrating out the heavy Higgs doublet, we get this um, scalar effective operator uh, automatically. And uh, for the right-handed vector interaction, um, it can be obtained by the so-called um, U1R portal. So in this case, we can combine the two dark matter component into one complex scalar and make a charge under a broken U1R symmetry. Then this um, massive gauge boson would mediate interaction between the dark matter and the right-handed leptons and eventually leads to the um, effective operator between the right-handed leptons and the two dark matter components. Um, there are also other possible UV completions to these uh, inelastic dark matter scenario, such as the uh, light dark photon and the light U1R portal. However, because of the appearance of these light states, they are not suitable for the uh, standard model effective field theory discussed here, but we do have some discussion of them in our paper. So um, here is a brief summary of what I have just talked about. Um, finally, we, I would like to mention that um, whether this xenon one-time excess is just due to treating background or due to a new physics um, is still an um, open question and it needs to be verified in uh, future electron recoil results. And we are very much looking forward to the um, new results from Panda X Photon and Xeno Anton. And yesterday we have heard about the first nuclear recoil result from Panda X Photon. And we would hope that we would know the electron recoil result in the near future. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. So any questions? Can I have one question? Yeah, go ahead. 
Yes, so uh, so have you checked? So so your decay of this X prime will give some kind of X-ray signals, right? So have you checked some constraints from the X-ray observations? Um, X-ray observations. Um, that's a good point, but I'm afraid that this um, decay rate is about um, ten to the ten about ten orders of magnitude larger than the age of the universe. And the um, constraint from the X rate is, um, well, I can't remember the exact number, but it is at most um, about two order of magnitude larger than the age of the universe. So I don't think we need to worry about it. Okay, so let's move on. Our next speaker, <laughs> is Nicholas uh, Berman. So he's going to talk about uh, detecting um, planetary mass uh, primordial black holes with uh, resonance the electromagnetic gravitational wave detectors. So can you share the screen? Uh, yes, I, I try to share my screen. I guess it's, it's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. oh. Sorry, it's the end. <laughs> uh, now the beginning. Okay. So now you can see my slides. Okay. So thank you for the introduction. So uh, I will speak about uh, detecting plan planetary mass primordial black hole with uh, electromagnetic gravitational wave detector. Mm -hmm. um, some words about uh, primordial black hole. So primordial black hole is uh, oh, sorry, it's a dark matter candidate. So it could explain at least a part of uh, the dark matter in the universe. There are some interests in uh, subsolar uh, mass detection because it will point to uh, a primordial origin. And we study two mechanisms of uh, primordial binary formation. Uh, the first is isolated primordial uh, binaries. So it's uh, primordial binaries that survived the expansion of the universe or um, tidal capture in uh, PBH halos. Um, and I want to highlight also that there is a link between the frequency of uh, emitted gravitational wave and the masses of the primordial black holes with uh, this formula. And um, our detector is based on the inverse Gelsenstein effect. So it's a gravitational wave passing through a constant transverse magnetic field. And so we have the gravitational wave, the constant magnetic field, and it will produce a faint electromagnetic wave. So we can apply this we, uh, theoretically to uh, gravitational wave detection. And it's suitable for high frequency signals like uh, for small masses merger like primordial black holes, light primordial black holes. And it will scope different bandwidth than the interferometer uh, detector like LIGO, LISA, and so on. Uh, for the modelization, we take the Maxwell equations in uh, GR to obtain the electromagnetic wave equation in, in GR. And for uh, the, the metric, we take a Minkowski background plus the incoming gravitational wave. And for the electromagnetic field, we assume the static external field, so the external magnetic field, and a perturbation, which is the uh, first order uh, perturbation, the, is the faint wave produced by the uh, Gershenstein effect. And with this, we, we obtain with uh, static field of hypothesis, a wave equation for the induced electromagnetic field sourced by the static field and a second derivative of the gravitational wave. Um, I want to um, 
to say that the it's very important that the magnetic field must be transverse to the direction of the gravitational wave. So it's verified by uh, in a theorem by Ivan Choke Brua that says that if the magnetic field is longitudinal, the source term will be uh, will vanish. Um, I, I would like uh, also say that um, we expect the same frequency content in the response of the detector than the um, gravitational wave. And so if you want to, um, to use, for example, the EDMX uh, experiment, there is a little problem because in EDMX, so here is EDMX, the magnetic field is longitudinal. And in our case, for example, here is the TM cavity, the hollow cavity, we have the uh, transverse magnetic field. And with um, there is another detector, uh, TEM cavity, but it's the same principle. So if we go back to our um, wave equation, we can project this on the proper function of, of Laplacian. And for each KMN mode, we can obtain a, an harmonic oscillator equation here. And if we want to compute the uh, energy variation inside our cavity at, at first order, um, we have this formula and we can show that only the K1 ho modes will contribute to the energy variation. And so with this uh, theoretical development, we can make some numerical simulations. Um, we use the uh, LAL simulation algorithm for a primordial black hole merger of two black holes of 10 to the minus five solar masses. And we have this waveform and this frequency content. And I made a small video to see what happened uh, numerically, oh, sorry, okay. So here are the two primordial black hole mergers, the gravitational wave coming into our cavity. And you can see here the um, generated, the induced power, the induced electromagnetic power inside of cavity. And we can see that at some point, the uh, frequency of the gravitational wave will induce resonant response. So the response will be boosted by a, a resonant effect. If you go to the, the slide in, in PDF, there is a link with another simulation for outreach with uh, sound an analogy. So here are the results for the TM cavity and the TM cavity. And in both cases, the induced power reached the round mean square value of 10 to the minus 10 watts. And if we look at the frequency response, we can see that we have the same frequency content in the response of the detector, but uh, there are some peaks here that corresponds to the fre uh, resonant frequencies of our uh, cavity. So uh, if we, we can study the response of the detector um, in function of the mass of the primordial black holes. And if we put a sensitivity on, of 10 to the minus 10 watts, we can put a kind of experiment, experimental limits on the fraction of dark matter made of a light primordial black hole. So here in yellow, it's the uh, microlensing observation um, that set these limits. And if we consider tidal capture in clusters, we can reach at, uh, at maximum 10 to minus four proportion, a uh, fraction of dark matter made of uh, PBH of 10 to minus five solar masses. And for primordial binaries um, isolated, we can reach nearly 10 to the minus eight. So, um, and if we want to slightly modify uh, the, the technique, we can tune uh, the uh, cavity parameters. 
So here, if we um, tune the uh, radius of our cavity, we can slightly change the mass sensitivity of our uh, cavity. And so uh, depending on exactly which mass we want to scope, we can uh, adapt the cavity. Um, so as a conclusion, so here we propose complementary gravitational wave detectors. Uh, it's, it scope different um, frequency than MIGO, LISA, and so on. Uh, I will also highlight that he, here it's theoretical numerical work. So it's, uh, it's uh, the, the first step, I will say. And uh, we can, for example, study the fraction of dark matter made of light PBH. Another application of this detector could be the um, cosmological gravitational wave stochastic background and maybe uh, scope its um, cutoff frequency. Uh, and more generally, it could be useful for fundamental physics from early universe cosmology to exotic compact object. And as I said before, it's theoretical numerical work. So uh, our goal here is to provide motivations for experimental development. And um, so uh, in the slide, you can see the link of uh, the link, sorry, of the archive paper here. And uh, the paper will be will be published uh, soon in uh, Physical Review D. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you. And a question? Okay, so if no more question, probably we were because our session has one talk canceled. So we are just uh, probably finished on time and uh, then we will have like uh, only eight minutes break. We'll be back by 58, okay, for the next session. Okay, see you later, let's have a break. Okay, I suggest the, we will start on time for the next half of the session. So please be back in uh, like eight minutes. Okay, uh, welcome back. Uh, so we can start the second half of this session. So Tony, are you ready? Yes. Okay, you can my screen. share your screen. Okay, so the talk of Dr. Zhou is about the dark matter search is archived or the so please go ahead. Hi everyone. Thanks the organizer for giving me the chance to talk about the dark matter searches at colliders. So the experimental searches of dark matter can be grouped into direct detection, indirect detection, and the collider search. In general, these three approaches <clears throat> provide a complementary information about the dark matter. In colliders, People are searching for the dark matter production in high energy particle collisions. Through colliders, we may find out the, some hint about the interaction mechanism between the dark matter and the stem model particles. So LHC has the highest collision energy and provides a unique opportunity to test a large variety of dark matter models. From effective field theory to simplify model or even to the ultra valid uh, complete, uh, complete model. So in this talk, I will focus on recent results of several selected dark matter models 
including the simplified model with mid data and some uh, some Higgs related document models. So in a simplified model, the mediator information is kept, like the spin of the mediator could be vector, axle, vector, etc., and the coupling between the dark, the mediator with dark matter and the model particles. So the under this framework, the collider search a collider can search for both the dark matter and the mediator directly. So that's very powerful. So for instance, the dark matter, if uh, uh, once produced in a collider, would escape of detection like neutrinos. So if uh, there is a visible particle generated together with the dark matter, then the detector will have uh, a momentum imbalance in the transverse plane. That's what we call it the missing transverse energy or missing, missing ET signature. This is called the mono X search. The X is a visible particle. So in proton proton collider, the most likely visible particle associated with dark matter is the initial state radiated gluon or quark. So that has the largest cross section. So this is this, the monojet final state that gives the strongest sensitivity in most of simplified model. So here is the excluder contour in the mediator mass and target mass plan. And we can see that the, the sensitivity to the mediator mass has reached up to 2 TeV. So on the other hand, the mediator is generated from the quark, quark annihilation or gluon fusion. So, so then decay to the dark matter, but it can also decay back to the quark or gluon. So therefore we can search for the mediator directly through the <coughs> digest channel. That's just looking for some resonance in this digest invariant mass spectrum. So this is a direct search of the mediator. The, the, the right is the current, uh, the left is the constraint on the mediator mass and the coupling between the, uh, of the Z prime to the, the mediator to the quark. So we can combine this mono X and uh, mediator search result together. That is shown in this uh, uh, mediator mass and dark matter mass uh, parameter space. The, the yellow contour is from the mono X and uh, the, the blue curve the, from the, is from the digest search, the mediator search. So this is uh, insensitive to the dark, dark matter mass. So that covers a really a lot of parameter space in this uh, figure. But we have to note that this constraint is very sensitive to the couplings. For instance, if we reduce the coupling to the quark from 0 0.25 down to 0 0.1, then the mediator will prefer decay to the dark matter if the dark matter mass is smaller than half of the mediator mass instead of to the digest or some other final state. That's why this constraint from the digest shrinks immediately to the left corner. So that leaves a lot of space uncovered, okay? So the results can be also compared with the direct detection experiment. So the Y, as <laughs> that's showing in this plot, the Y axis is uh, the dark matter nuclear uh, interaction cross section. And the, y, the X axis is a dark, dark matter mass. The vector mediator, it can produce the spin independent interaction in the direct detection. So as shown here, the collider is able to cover the small dark matter mass region on the left, and the xenon based uh, direct detection experiment is focused more on the high mass region like the Panda X. The, some interesting is for this uh, Exo vector mediator that uh, can produce the spin dependent interaction at tree level. 
So the, in the direct detection experiment, the spin of the target nucleus is mainly carried either by the unpaired proton or neutron. So it's highly dependent, uh, depending on the, the target itself. So the, but the collider doesn't distinguish uh, proton or neutron. Therefore, in this uh, dark matter proton interaction spin dependent case, the collider search just cover, uh, cover the most of the uh, dominant the sensitivity, while on the, the direct detection like uh, from the flooring target uh, can provide some sensitivity here, but not Xenon. Okay, that's the advantage of the collider search. So besides the general simplified model, collider search pay special attention to the Higgs portal dark matter model. So after Higgs discovery, one immediate question is that can Higgs decay to dark matter? So at Clyde, we can search for such a decay, the Higgs, the, the Higgs invisible decay. There are multiple channels, signatures like the model Z, or the, BBF, the VBF Higgs, or the TT bar Higgs. And recently, the combined results from Atlas indicate that the Higgs invisible decay brain ratio should be smaller than 0 0.11 at 95% uh, confidence level. So this also can be converted into this, uh, <coughs> the compared with the direct detection. The Higgs as a scalar mediator with the Yokawa coupling it gives the spin independent interaction. But the, but the, the constraint also has some dependence on the dark matter spin. So the, the blue curve is for the scalar dark matter. The red curve on the left is for the Madrena fermion dark matter. So it's uh, very sensitive to the uh, the, to the dark matter if mass below half of the Higgs mass. So another interesting Higgs decay is the, the partially invisible Higgs. Higgs decay to dark photon and one photon. So these uh, search, searches are very similar to the invisible Higgs, except it require one additional energetic photon. And the CMS and others also the give strong constraint on that. Uh, you give the branch ratio of his decay to gamma and dark photon should be smaller than 0 0.014 and 95% confidence level. Okay. So another model is uh, the is the dark Higgs. This is the dark matter has mass. In the dark sector, we can ask the origin of this mass. It may have the similar Higgs mechanism as the STEM model. So there should, could be a dark Higgs boson. And in a simplified model, we can have the dark Higgs and dark matter, and also Z prime mediator connecting the STEM model with the dark sector. So the, the the below are the two typical diagrams for the uh, dark Higgs production at the uh, uh, colliders. So the dark Higgs then once produced can decay to the, <coughs> sorry, can decay to the vector boson since it has some mixing with the stem model Higgs. So the, to maintain <coughs> a high uh, sensitivity or signal rate. We require that uh, the two, the two boson, vector boson from the Tarkis decay, uh, decay to four quarks, that highest uh, branch ratio. But uh, the Tarkis is strongly boosted after Z prime decay. So the four quarks are so close to each other that they are more, <coughs> merged as one fed jet. So to identify such a 
fast jet is really challenging. So at the Atlas, a newly developed track track assist <coughs> the track assisted reclustering algorithm is impl mm -hmm. is implemented. So for one GV Z prime and the 200 GV dark matter, the dark heat mass between 180 and the 230 GV is excluded. <coughs> the last model, <coughs> sorry, the last model in my talk is the two heat doubling model. And then in order to connect this model with dark matter, so one <coughs> additional uh, uh, mediator is introduced. So um, the mediator could be a pseudo scanner. This is a two hex type model plus A. <coughs> that gives a rich phenomenology as shown in the right uh, uh, diagrams. So that can have uh, lots of channels. Could be searched. <coughs> could be searched for this chat for this uh, model. One so the results. Are, one minute. You have one okay. Minute. Yeah. So for uh, for this model, we combine the mono Higgs, mono Z, invisible Higgs, and the photon channel. So the results, the constraint shown in this plot, either on the tending beta or MA, best best, or the the M bigger A and the small A, best best. Okay. So the <coughs> Summary. <coughs> Design this model mentioned here, there are many others, like uh, Susie and the long lived particles. And uh, the, the Higgs related dark matter models recently have captured a lot of attention. <coughs> it may provide some information about the dark sector. And the future lepton collider will join this effort. So the, the, you can find that uh, more information in Manchi's talk next. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so do you have any questions or comments? I may have a quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so what you are talking about, basically, I think is related to some some kind of new particles. Uh, so, does that necessary to be dark matter in your? Uh... Yeah, the that's the in the collider we can produce the new particle, invisible particle, but uh, they have to be uh, combined with the direct detection or indirect detection to make sure this is the. The, the really the dark matter in the cosmic in the universe so okay yeah, that just provides some candidate okay okay so, so thank you for this talk so the thank next you. one the next one is by manchi manchi are you ready yes let me try to share my screen can you see my screen? Yes, yes, so please go ahead. Okay, excellent. Yeah, thanks uh, very much for inviting me to give this talk. And also thank you, thanks Lin for this pre-introduction uh, pre, pre to, to my talk. Yeah, indeed, I will continue with, uh, on Lin's trend and talking about uh, the Higgs search, uh, sorry, talk about the dark matter search where the Higgs decay at the future lepton glider, the CEPC, okay. So at the very beginning that uh, we certainly know that the standard model is not the end of the story. There is many, many known unknowns of the standard model, including the dark matters. And as listed here, there are many, many different issues, many problems of the standard model. And what makes it interesting is that most of these issues related to the Higgs. And in this sense that we would really like to study the details of the Higgs properties and trying to looking for the new fundamental principles of the particle physics. Of the world. So that is basically motivated a lot uh, the future collider studies, including the CPC and SPPC project.
So the CEPC and SPPC project is a circular collider. And uh, on page today, we simply listed a few uh, fundamental orders of magnitude of this facility. So the tunnel, the main circumference of the tunnel will be of the order of 100 kilometer. And as, uh, as in the electron positron collision phase in the CEPC, it will be uh, delivering 1 million Higgs boson, nearly 1 tera Z boson, and 100 million uh, W boson. It also has the capability to be upgraded to, a top, to the top threshold. And so it can also produce roughly 1 million top octels if we are upgrading the central mass energy from 240 GeV to 360 GeV. And in the long future, because of the circular nature, then it can be also updated uh, to a proton collider with the central mass energy of uh, the order 100 TeV. So altogether, it makes a very, very uh, in intensive and interesting and complementary uh, uh, science program for many, many decades. And for the Higgs, the Higgs produced at this electron positron collider, especially as a low energy, is meaning through the Higgs stratum processes. So the left hand plot gives you the, 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 the cross sections as a function of the central mass energy for many leading standard model processes. And what you can see immediately is that uh, at such a uh, collider, electron positron Higgs factory, then the signal of noise ratio is actually very high. So if you uh, operate it, uh, for example, at the peaking value of the ZH uh, process, then the signal to noise ratio, uh, I mean, then the signal event versus the inclusive standard model event will be of the order of percent level. So it's really a very clean machine. And uh, meanwhile, a major advantage of the CEPC uh, is that uh, most of the uh, Higgs boson is generated with the Higgs stratum process, the ZH process, which will enable us to do very good uh, dark matter search via the Higgs invisible decay, because you can basically tag the Higgs signal by using the recall, recall side, by using uh, the reconstructed Z boson information. Okay. And to make, the, make out uh, most of the physics uh, out of this facility that we have uh, dedicated uh, detector and software development. So currently in our baseline design, then the detector is designed following the so-called particle flow uh, principle, which is to say that by using the very, very high granularity calorimeter system, we could, in principle, separate uh, all the final state particles in a physics collision. And this gives you a very intensive uh, information of the, in, of the event and will basically help you to characterize the event very clearly. So on page six, I simply show a few event displays corresponding to the different uh, final state of the ZH event. And you can immediately see that they have very, very different uh, topologies. They can easily be separated even by human eyes. So that is to say, basically, our, our, our software and reconstruction will do more or less the same work as a human eye and can basically characterize, can count very clearly uh, the different number of events with the different generation and decay modes of the Higgs events. So uh, more statistically, then is to say that we can see very clear Higgs signals in all the Higgs decay channels. And here we basically show the leading decay mode of the standard model Higgs like to jets and to muons, to photons, and also to the vector bosons, to the W and the Zs. And also we can do, we can identify very clearly the Higgs signals if the Higgs goes to invisible. And the trick is very straightforward using the recall mass method. So uh, actually, each event while 80% of the Z decays into visible final state. So by reconstructing precisely, can you still hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. So by reconstructing uh, the, the visible Z decay, then we can tag the Higgs signal via this recall mass method. 
So the left and the middle plot is corresponding to the leptonic Z decay. And this is actually for inclusive Higgs, uh, Higgs invent finding for the inclusive uh, cross-section measurement. So what you can say is that you can see very clearly Higgs signal peak in the recall mass spectrum. And uh, then basically, if you want to find the invisible Higgs signal here, you just look into the decay product of the other side. And of course, it also holds for the cases where the Z decays into a pair of the, of the jets. And in this naptonic channel, actually, we have the majority of the statistic. And this channel actually is most sensitive to the Higgs invisible decay. OK. And uh, so we performed the simulation studies based on fully simulated data. And then we can basically extract the final distributions of the Higgs signal or in the recall mass distribution and in three different channels. So basically, if we assume a Higgs to invisible decays of the order of roughly 10%, which is corresponding to today's up limit, as you heard in Ling's talk, and then we can see in the QQ Higgs channel, then we will be able to reach, uh, to reach an accuracy of percentage level already. And the leptonic channels of electrons and the muons, so they all contribute also pretty significantly. And of course, this accuracy is depending on the actual branching ratio of the Higgs to invisible. So this result is summarized into the left-hand plot in page 10. And this basically shows the anticipated accuracy as a function of the branching ratio of the Higgs to invisible. And meanwhile, we also make extract the up limit information and use the chi-square method. And basically, uh, as listed in the right-hand corner, then we can have the 95% clearance level up limit for the different uh, uh, ZDK modes. And the combined results needs to up limit of 0.3%, uh, uh, basically. Okay. And uh, on the performance side, it is also very interesting. Uh, because you can see that the leading part of this uh, up limit of this uh, sensitivity is coming from the QQ Higgs event, as uh, the Z2QQ has the leading uh, statistic, of course. So then it would be interesting to look into the physics requirements uh, on reconstructing this uh, uh, hydronically decayed Z. So for this purpose, actually, uh, we performed a faster simulation study and, uh, uh, and basically start, uh, extract the anticipated accuracy at the different uh, reconstructed digit mass uh, resolution, which we call as a BMI in the right-hand plot. So uh, in this modeling, we're considering the leading background of the ZZ because they have exactly the same final states. And uh, for the ZZ background and the ZH signal, uh, the most significant way to separate them through the recall mass method. And if you can reconstruct very precisely the digest system, you can see that their peaks is clearly separated. Each one is uh, picking at the Z mass, the other picking at the Higgs mass. But as you start to degrade uh, the hydronic system reconstruction, then very soon these two peaks will start to merge with each other. So this pattern actually leads to this S curve dependency of the final accuracy. And from this curve, we basically made of uh, quantified the physics requirement, saying that the hydronic system should be reconstructed with a relative accuracy of 4% four, 4 in its invariant mass. OK, so then come to my summary. I think the CEPC as an electron positron Higgs factor is a very good prop for the dark matter search where well the Higgs uh, uh, portal. So given the branching ratio of 10%, the Higgs to invisible signal can actually be determined to a relative accuracy of 1%. Uh, this 10% branching ratio is more roughly of the order of the current, uh, current uh, up limit. And uh, then the up limit of this facility can be set to 0.26%. And the recall mass method is actually essential for this analysis. And a good reconstruction of the hydronic decay Z is essential where we require the hydronic system to be measured to a relative accuracy of better than 4% in terms of its invariant mass. And what is also interesting is that if you look into the LHC result now, to the extrapolation of the high luminosity LHC, to the future E plus E minus Higgs factory, 
and to the long future to the PV glider uh, of the SPVC of the 100 TeV uh, central mass energy, we will see that this up limit can be each boosted by roughly one order of magnitude in each step. So I think, uh, yeah, so that is basically showing you kinds of uh, uh, the, the accessibility of the dark matter in, uh, in, our, in our colliders. Okay, yeah, I'm done, thank you. Thank you, Manchi. Uh, so any questions? It, it just for this slide, so uh, you, for, for the high luminosity LHC and the CEPC, they have somehow similar uh, luminosity, but the limits on this uh, uh, Higgs to invariable is quite, the, the CEPC yeah. was by an order of magnitude. So what's this reason? The reason is that the, the recall mass method, basically. So, I mean, for the high luminosity LHC, as Lin just said, it's meaning coming from the from also the Higgs-Strelon and the VBF processes. But uh, in the in the in the high luminosity LHC, the background is pretty high, and also it is not really a peaking signal. But at the CEPC, then the signal to noise ratio is much better. And uh, typically, if uh, we take a look at our invariant selection chain, uh, for instance, in page nine, then you can see that we at an inclusive event uh, efficiency of 60%, which is very high, then we can basically limit uh, the signal and the background to the same level. So to put a long story short, then it is because it's very clean. And it's because we can use the recall mass method, which gives you a very, very clear uh, hit the signal right at its uh, mass peak. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So if no, let's uh, move on. So thank, thank you, Manch. Thank you. The next one is by Xiang Li from Purple Mountain Observatory. So he will talk about the the recent status and the results of the dark matter particle explorer. Okay. Yes. Okay. Can, can you hear me and uh, see my uh, screen? Yes. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Good day, friends. I'm Li Xiang from uh, Purple Mountain Observatory. It is my great pleasure to share with you the status and scientific results of the dark matter particle explorer. DAMP is a China Europe collaborating project uh, with five institutes from China, four from Italy, and uh, one from the Switzerland. And here's the outline. I'm going to introduce first the DAMP mission and then its status and its scientific results. So starting with the uh, dark matter problem, since this is a dark matter session, I suppose that everyone here agrees that dark matter is very important and very interesting. And there are three typical ways to probe dark matter. Uh, direct direction, uh, collider direct detection, and indirect detection. And the space-based dark matter detection is uh, indirect detection. The dark matter, uh, the properties of the dark matter are supposed to be found by sitting for the uh, final product uh, in space, such as uh, the electrons, the gamma rays, and uh, some antimatters uh, from dark matter annihilation or decay. To achieve it, we need high energy resolution, high angular resolution, high statistics and uh, low background cosmic ray election and gamma ray experiments. The other, the other important uh, scientific problem is the origin, acceleration, and uh, propagation of the cosmic rays. As I just said, the space-based space dark matter experiments actually observe cosmic rays. So it's naturally also aimed to cosmic ray physics. And there are, there are quite a few uh, excellent space cosmic ray and gamma ray experiments in recent years, including Pamela, AMS, Fermi, 
pellet, nuclear ice cream, and so on. And then I will change to the damp mission. In December uh, 2015, China launched the dark matter uh, damp satellite and uh, joined the campaign to study dark matter particles, cosmic ray physics, and gamma ray astronomy. Here are the three major scientific objectives of DAMP. Today it is a dark matter session, so I'm not going to say much about the cosmic ray and or gamma ray, or gamma ray astronomy. A DAMP detector is made up of four sub-detectors. The plastic, uh, the top one is plastic uh, scintillator, the detector, uh, and the six silicon tracker, the BGO calorimeter, and the neutron detector. The mirror, the mirror different, they mirror different uh, physical properties over the unit particles, and uh, some properties are cross measured. Just in a picture, uh, generally, generally speaking, we use the calorimeter to distinguish, to measure the energy first, and distinguish nuclei and the leptons, and then use the PSD on the top, which is a charge detector distinguish whether a particle is charged or not. Hence, we picked up uh, the electrons or gamma rays, uh, which play a very important role in dark matter in direct detection. <coughs> on you know, the orbit, orbit status. Since the launch on December 17, 2015, DAMP has operated on orbit for 5.5 years. Uh, surveyed the sky for 11 times and recorded more than 10 billion events. Each, each sub-detector operates, uh, operates very stably, uh, just uh, within, you can see it's within 1% level of the variation for the pedestal. Then we can measure the char charge clearly and also have a very good, uh, good uh, angular resolution. The, the, the energy measurement is especially good by them. It's a, uh, uh, say, we, we can measure, we can measure the, the MIPS clearly, very, very clearly, and uh, the, we can measure the, we have uh, two independent measure, measurement or two, two sides, but both sides are independent measurement for the energy. They, they are very consistent. And uh, the energy linearity is very good. Also the energy resolution, this forms the flight data. And also uh, a very extensive, extensive uh, beam tests have been done to verify the design performance of the detector here. I show some uh, results with electron beams. The detector has a very good linearity uh, over the energy measurement and the energy resolution can reach a level of 1% above 50 GeV. The, the particle identification is another, uh, another very good, uh, another advantage for them. It, it used uh, a lateral, you use lateral and the longitudinal properties in the in the calorimeter to distinguish the, the showers from leptons and hydrogen. Hydrogen. For for a, a nine, ninety percent uh, electron efficiency, a proton background can reach a, a two percent level at, at TV. And we also use the beam test data and uh, the on-orbit gamma ray data to validate the electron-proton separation method. And the physical results, sorry, okay. So using the first year, first 1.5 years of data, we published the total electron plus position spectrum from 25 GeV to 4.6 six TV energy. In this analysis, we applied uh, three PID methods 
to give very consistent results on event by event level. And this spectrum reveals clearly a, a break, a spectral break with a, a high significance uh, of a, a 6.6 .6 sigma. And the analysis with new good data is, is going on, is ongoing. And the good news is that our uncertainties are dominated by by the statistical uncertainties, uh, especially above TV. So with the increase of data or statistics, the precision can be increased, can be increased considerably. And what does the spectral break mean? A possible interpretation <coughs> precision is the uh, discreteness of the high energy sources for distribution in the space and time. Uh, a rough estimate gives that, uh, for example, of, for TV elections, the cooling time is about a mega year, and uh, the propagation distance is about a uh, kilo PC. Uh, assuming supernova to be the sources of these electrons, the number of supernova that can contribute to TV electrons is only a few. This is a, an example of the theoretical spectrum of the electrons, considering a couple of nearby sources. That measures the, photon, the proton spectrum uh, from uh, 40 GeV to 100 TeV energies, and the helium spectrum from 70 GeV to 80 G TeV with a, with a very high precision. The spectrum confirms the 100 GeV hardening and, de and both, detect, detect, both detect a clear softening at, a, uh, at about, above 10 TeV. For, for proton, it's about 40, 14 TeV, and for, for helium, it's about 34 TeV. And this, this indicating, uh, indicates a nearby source, maybe some uh, nearby sources with a uh, Z-dependent acceleration. And Temp, uh, thanks to Temp's uh, very, very high energy resolution, it, it can, it can, uh, it can do a, <coughs> it plays a, a, a very, very efficient, efficient way in the search for the line-like emission from gamma rays. So here's a very, so here's a preliminary result for the five-year gamma ray line search result. It's it's uh, it's a pity that we we did not we have haven't see a very clear a very significant line feature, but we, we will now have the, the most stringent upper limits on the dark matter annihilation cross cross section or decay lifetime. So as a summary, Temple detector works mostly for five years and a half. Open a new window to look at the, the high energy universe above TV. Precise measurement of the electron and the position spectrum shows uh, a brick at about TV energies. The most stringent upper limits on dark matter annihilation or and decay into the gamma ray lines have been obtained. So, and more results about uh, cosmic ray nuclei and gamma rays and maybe uh, electron are coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. So questions or comments? Yeah, let me ask a quite quick question. Uh, now you have like five on the five year of the data. When it's going to announce the electron uh, spectrum? The, the electron cosmic ray data. You mean when will we? Uh, 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 the next announce, next announcement. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, Is that going to be soon within this year uh, or some? How many years? Or next year? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> so we're still uh, accumulating the statistics. Yes. Mm-hmm.
Okay, uh, Stefan, or you have a question? Uh, uh, excuse me, I have a question. May I ask a question? Yes, sure. Sure. Uh, yes, so the question is also a comment. So your data is extremely interesting, not only for dark matter, but also to uh, know better how the, our galaxy is made. Also because to search for dark matter, we need to reconstruct first uh, the secondaries. We need to, dis to, to know, for instance, the, 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 the magnetic field, the diffusion, the size of the diffusion region of our galaxy. So we need modeling. So uh, people have been using Galprop for years trying to calculate dark matter signals, but actually uh, we need to uh, more data to improve these, these, uh, these uh, uh, codes. So I'm just curious to know what is the progress in also uh, improving our knowledge of just standard processes using your data from Dampe or from other experiments? Uh. It's, it's a very general question. I think. Uh, yeah, general question. Yeah. It's, yes. Uh, I think uh, every every moment is is is, is uh, precious. I think, uh, and uh, uh, maybe not only for not only electrons and, and the gamma rays is, is helpful, and uh, all the cosmic ray nuclei they also contribute for the for the for the propagation and everything in in the in the galaxy. So I can turn my question in another way. Uh, when you when you put some limits, you need a model. So are you yes. using standard models, or you are improving the model first, the model uh -huh. of the boundaries, and then with your with your data, and then you analyze, or you are just using the standard, the, the models that are available in literature. But you know, uh, you are adding so much new information that I guess that Galprop now is no longer. I mean, it should be updated every week or almost or at least it should be updated, you understand? So uh, the point is, uh, we, um, what kind of model do you use for the background in order to get limits, for instance, for antiprotons or for some positrons? Actually, we, actually we are marrying the, the, the cosmic ray spectrum for what we, we can get. And uh, what, I think what, what you mean is uh, for, for the theoretical interpretation? No, for uh, uh, in order to put a, a, a limit on the signal, first you have to know the background. If you don't know what is the uh, the, the rate for ah, second, you, 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 you gamma ray, right? Gamma ray, right? you know? ray. Yeah. Gam no, no, antiprotons, for instance, antiprotons or uh, positrons. You, if you if you don't know, uh, okay, positrons has other problems. So suppose antiprotons. In the case of antiprotons. Um, um, yeah, you, uh, th there are many uncertainties in the knowledge of, for instance, of the diffusion region, the size of the diffusion region. So we don't know what uh, the magnetic field of our galaxy is. So it's very difficult to, we use a diffusion model, but there are parameters that are very un are unknown. So I, I was just curious to know if you're using your new data to uh, improve uh, the parameters that are used in the codes that model our galaxy in order then to use for dark matter. You know, it's a first step. First, we have to know our galaxy. The second step is to try to look for dark matter. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, probably so, so, it's a too okay. general question. Sorry. <laughs> I can have a quick comment about this. Yeah, uh, of course you are right. So what can, um, um, we, we should uh, use our measurements, for example, like this proton spectrum, the helium spectrum, together with other new measurements, for example, by AMS, to improve the understanding of the background model, and then to try to constrain the dark matter, dark matter model. So for the, for the damping experiment, uh, however, we basically cannot uh, detect this antiparticles so like the protons or antiprotons, we cannot uh, uh, distinguish them from like the protons and the electrons because we just a calorimeter uh, experiment. It's not a magnetic uh, spectrometer, but uh, I, yeah, I would say that you are definitely right. We should uh, uh, first uh, to improve the understanding of the background model. Okay, thank you. Okay, so so I think his time is <laughs> quite limited. So thanks, Sean, again, and we. Okay, thank have you. To...
the next speaker is uh, Yuta um, Mishimura. So Yuta, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Um, okay, good. Do you see my full screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk about the ultralight vector dark matter search using a cryogenic gravitational wave telescope cover in Japan. Um, so maybe I don't have to introduce this, but there's uh, various um, dark matter candidates. And our focus is on the ultralight dark matter, which is the lightest end of this dark matter candidate uh, mass spectrum. And um, our search, in our search, we are trying to use laser interferometers. So why? Um, so ultralight bosonic fields are well motivated by cosmology because they behave as classical waves rather than particles. And if you calculate the frequency of these um, waves, um, it's something like this. So for 10 to the minus 12 electron volts, um, the frequency is around 200 hertz, which is the most sensitive region for a gravitational wave detector. So gravitational wave detector is a laser interferometer, which works something like this. So when gravitational wave comes, length changes and the interference pattern changes, so you can detect gravitational waves. But this length change can be from gravitational waves, but it can be also from dark matter signal. For example, for well, in our case, we think about tiny forces acting on the mirrors from a gauge boson dark matter. So our target is a gauge boson, and which is a new one, new gauge boson, which is associated with possible new physics, uh, possible new gauge symmetry. And this gauge boson could be a dark matter. And in, in our case, we focus on uh, B minus L um, gauge boson. So since this B minus L baryon number minus lepton number is conserved in the, in the standard model and can be gauged without introducing additional ingredients to the standard model, um, I think we, we think that this B minus L gauge boson is pr pretty promising. And um, so this number of uh, B minus L is roughly um, equals to the number of neutrons. And if you consider some ordinary um, uh, not charged neutral um, matter, it's roughly 0 0.5 per neutron mass. But it's slightly different because the neutron ratio is different between materials. And if you think about, for example, fused silica, it's um, roughly 0 0.5. But if you think about sapphire, it's a 0 0.51 because it's slightly more neutron rich. And um, since our um, Earth is filled with dark matter field, this gauge boson field, if you have a suspended mirror like this, you will get some oscillating force because the mirror has discharge. And um, um, acceleration caused, acceleration of mirrors caused by this oscillating force can be um, expressed as this formula. And the amplitude of this acceleration is um, proportional to the coupling constant. So um, coupling constant of associated force and it's also proportional to charge. So B minus L charge, we, assume, uh, we consider B minus L charge here. And, the, and uh, um, interestingly, the, the force is um, oscillating at the frequency of um, MA, which is a gauge boson mass. So from the um, oscillation frequency, you can um, know that you can know the boson mass. And also from the amplitude, you can get the coupling constant for this force. And if you consider using a cavity, which measures the distance between one mirror and the other mirror, and if this cavity is symmetric, uh, mirrors move like this in a symmetric way. Um, if they are the same, they are made of same material. So the length doesn't change. So you cannot measure um, the length change if you use this kind of normal interferometer. But since there is some phase difference between um, the different positions, there are some residual effects. Um, and if you if you use longer cavity, the residual effect will be larger. So um, 
the, there was a proposal to use long baseline laser interferometric gravitational wave detectors um, proposed by this paper. And actually, um, um, there was a, there's already a search using um, LIGO's um, O1 data and also O3 data. So this is the limit um, obtained from analyzing the O3 data, which is reported in this archive paper. And um, this um, x-axis is the frequency, which is basically the mass of the gauge boson. And this y-axis is the coupling constant. And this dotted line shows previous limits from equivalence principle tests. And the LIGO obtained the better limits compared with the equivalence principle tests. And our proposal is to search for such um, gauge bosons using Kagura, Japanese detector Kagura. And as you may know, the Kagura is less sensitive than LIGO in the current um, um, current sensitivity. So you might ask, why do we want to repeat the search using Kagura? So let's see how gravitational wave detector works. Gravitational wave detector looks like this. And um, what we usually use is this um, X arm length and the Y arm length. And uh, we measure the length between a length difference between this X arm and the Y arm and detect the interference pattern at this um, detection point, and which and the signal is proportional to LX minus LY. Since the gravitational wave detector, uh, gravitational waves introduce differential arm length change, um, this is very sensitive to, to gravitational wave detectors. But if you have a gauge field, um, the mirrors move like this. So they move um, almost in a common way so even if you are measuring LX minus LY, uh, most of the signal is canceled out. So, so even if LIGO is very sensitive, LIGO or Virgo is very sensitive, um, sensitivity, to dark, uh, sensitivity to dark matter is um, um, uh, pretty much canceled out. But the color is different. So um, um, as the color suggests, these four mirrors, which we call test masses, are made of cryogenic sapphire mirrors. And the other mirrors are made of pure silica, like in, as in LIGO and Virgo. So we use different material for the different mirrors. So if you remember that the sapphire has larger charge compared with pure silica um, in the B minus L charge, um, the mirrors move like this. So the sapphire mirror moves uh, larger than other pure silica mirrors. So if you are um, also focusing on LX minus LY, which is a gravitational wave channel, um, the signal is also canceled out, out. This is the same as in the case in LIGO and Virgo. But if you can measure the distance between this auxiliary mirror and the sapphire mirror, you can measure the difference in the force acting on different material. And we actually use this auxiliary length channel. So these are um, considered to be auxiliary because um, no gravitational wave signal is present in this signal. So we don't usually um, use this for the data analysis, but we, um, but for the dark matter, this signal is very useful as I explained. So if you use these auxiliary length signals with a um, um, design sensitivity of cover, uh, the reach for the B minus L coupling for a different gauge boson mass is something like this. So yellow region and the uh, um, blue, pale blue region is excluded by microscope mission and the torsion pendulum experiment. And this dotted line is uh, expected sensitivity if you observe with Kagura for one year. And um, at, at the high frequencies where the, um, the wavelength of gauge boson is small compared with the arm lengths, the dam sensitivity, so gravitational waves channel is more sensitive compared with auxiliary lengths, but at the low frequency where the um, gauge boson wavelengths is com uh, longer or comparable to the arm lengths, um, auxiliary lengths are more sensitive because we use sapphire and fused silica for these uh, measurements. And um, especially if you use uh, what we call Mitch degrees of freedom, Michelson degrees of freedom, um, you can improve the sensitivity compared with the microscope mission um, by an order of magnitude. So we are excited about this, and uh, we are we now actually have our data, uh, which were um, obtained in 2020. 
we actually performed the first observing run for Kagura in 2020 with this sensitivity. So these dotted lines are the design sensitivity for Kagura, and these um, solid lines are the major ones, so the current sensitivity. We still have like six orders of magnitude to go at like 10 hertz. Um, so we are not as sensitive as we um, design yet. But anyway, we have some data. And we are now developing a data analysis pipeline to search for this gauge boson dark matter. And I will briefly introduce how our data analysis pipeline work. Um, um, the signal is nearly monochromatic because the frequency of the signal is determined by the mass of the gauge boson, but it's slightly um, shifted to high frequencies because it has kin kinetic energy. And the distribution of this um, uh, uh, velocity of dark matter particle is a uh, Maxwell Boltzmann um, um, distribution. So if you calculate the distribution of the frequency, um, you will get this kind of spectrum. So you basically have a monochromatic signal, but with a line width of around 10 to the minus six. So it's very monochromatic, but it, it has um, 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 very narrow um, peak. And uh, we stuck the spectrum in this frequency region to calculate the signal noise ratio. So this is the data, and this is the estimated noise of the detector. So you can calculate the signal to noise ratio using this calculation um, equation. And we stuck this signal to noise ratio in this frequency region where the dark matter signal is present. And the threshold is determined assuming this raw signal to noise ratio follows the chi square distribution, which means we are assuming Gaussian noise if there's no signal. And from distrib uh, the distribution of this um, Detection statistic, a statistic, uh, we can calculate a 95% upper limit on the coupling constant epsilon. And we actually applied this pipeline with mock data for the verification. And this is the example um, result of the mock data um, um, analysis. These um, blue lines are calculated uh, the, from the mock data signal to noise ratio. And this um, orange line is the signal to noise ratio threshold. And we actually can successfully um, detect the injected signal. So, and also we calculated the upper limit using this mock data. And to calculate the upper limit, you have to take into account the stochastic nature of the dark matter signal. So I will explain what is this. So dark matter signal is a superposition of many waves. So we have many ultralight dark matter particles in our universe. So it's us, so waves are superposed. And that each, each wave has different momentum and also different phase. And now we are in a vector um, case. So we also have a polarization. And if you superpose all those signals, um, the, sig the shape of the time series um, signal shape looks like this. So it's nearly monochromatic if you um, focus on um, a small amount of time. But the amplitude and phase is fluctuating at the time scale of tau, which is determined by this equation. So if you are looking for the smaller mass um, dark matter, um, in this case, this tau will be larger. And uh, if the tau is larger than your observing time, um, you could be detecting, you could be trying to detect the dark matter signal when, uh, when the dark matter amplitude is small. So maybe even if you don't see the signal, it could be that the dark matter signal was too small and eluded detection by, by chance. So at the low frequencies, you have to take a low frequencies or low mass region, you have to take into account this stochastic nature. And if you, you, if you calculate the upper limit using the, um, using the average amplitude, you will get this deterministic upper limit but um, if you think about this stochastic effect, um, um, the upper, actual upper limit will be this orange line. So at the low frequency, it's like... Right. One minute left. Ah, okay, thank you. So at the low frequency, it's like factor of three worse if you consider this stochastic nature. But at the high frequency, it's, um, it, it will converge into the same um, upper limit. And anyway, we developed a method to calculate this upper limit considering this stochastic effect. 
And now we actually have the data from Kaga. So we are now applying the pipeline to two sets of um, 10 second, uh, 10,000 seconds of data. And uh, we also um, um, developed a beta um, pipeline using the sharpness of the peak and also consistency between two sets of data. And actually we found some outliers, um, the candidates, um, mostly in the noise contaminated frequency region. And uh, since we are not sensitive enough, um, we think they are not the dark matter signal. So we are trying to work on the further veto by um, adding more um, veto procedure. But anyway, we obtained some proof of principle results from actual camera data. And uh, we can, um, unfortunately, we cannot show this because um, um, the collaboration review is now um, ongoing. But anyway, um, we did some um, analysis. So here's a summary. Um, Kagura can do unique gauge boson dark motor search because we use sapphire and fused silica. So it's very different from live and verbal. And we actually um, doing the analysis using the actual data in 2020. And um, in the future, we are observing this uh, more sensitive, better sensitivity. So please stay tuned for our new results. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So any quick question? Okay, thank you. So if no, let's uh, move on to the- Thank you very much. Yeah, next one by Ryan Keeney. Mm -hmm. um, Julie? Yes, Mr. Head. All right, you can all see my screen and my cursor? Yes. All right, great. Um, so uh, hello everyone, I'm Ryan Keeley, a postdoc with the Cosmology Group at um, the Korea Astronomy Space Science Institute. Um, I'd first like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk and you all for attending. Um, I've, been in, I've been here in Korea for almost three years now, though tomorrow I'm leaving to start another job back in the US. Um, though today I'm gonna to be telling about how my collaborators and I derived strong constraints on WIMP annihilation from the galactic center. Um, so over the past few years, I've been spending a lot of time trying to answer the question, what is dark matter? Is it a particle? Is it a part of a whole dark sector as complex as the standard model? Is it nothing beyond gravity as in primordial black holes? Um, but with really only a few constraints, there's a whole host of different ideas about what dark matter could be, as you can see here. Um, so in my quest to try and find out what dark matter is, I primarily looked at indirect detection signals since they in particular would benefit from potentially large signals since they would come from where we know dark matter is. Um, and in particular, I've been using the Fermi Space Telescope um, to try to search for WIMP annihilation signals coming from nearby dark matter halos like the Galactic Center or Milky Way dwarfs. Um, so now I'm going to explain a bit about how people use the Fermi Gamma Ray data to look for dark matter. Um, so on the right here, we have the full sky data from the Fermi Space Telescope. Um, all modeling of this data is done basically via template fitting. So you take a bunch of known templates, for example, an isotropic background, diffuse emission, which would largely come from pions or inverse Compton emission, um, the, the Fermi bubbles, which are just um, empirical things, um, and then point sources. So basically, if you put in all the baryonic physics you can think of, and then subtract those predictions from the data, um, and then see if any extended emission remains. Um, and so when you do this, um, when you optimize all the fluxes of the various templates and subtract them from the data, an unaccounted for excess of gamma rays remains. And this excess has come to be known as the galactic center extended excess. And it's particularly exciting since it has the potential to be interpreted as dark matter, dark, annihilating dark matter. So there's three lines of evidence that um, support this interpretation. Um, so the first is that the data is roughly, um, the, the data is roughly spherical or consistent with a spherical NHW squared profile with an inner slope of gammas like 1.2 or more precisely, when you add in a spherical NFW squared template, it's preferred over no, no, no additional templates. Um, so further, the, the data peak at a few GeV, which is where the spectrum of dark matter annihilating through say B quarks would peak um, for dark matter masses around tens to hundreds of GeV. Um, and finally, the flux of the signal, it would be consistent with the cross section needed for WIMPs to thermally produce the right amount of dark matter, the observed amount of dark matter, um, the thermal relic cross section. Um, but how, however, um, the galactic center could also be interpreted as coming from pulsars. Um, interestingly, even before it was known that WIMP annihilation, be before any dark, um, GCE signal was, was detected, it was known that WIMP annihilation could be confused with pulsars, um, basically because they have the same spectrum. 
Um, so, so how can we tell the difference? We can't just use a small difference in spectra. We have to attack the other lines of evidence. Um, and so, so basically, the first idea is to look for complementary signals in different um, dark matter objects. So different regions with different amounts of dark matter versus different amounts of stars will generate different predictions for the gamma ray flux between these two different models. Um, so we, when we look at the Milky Way doors, we would expect to see a gamma ray signal if the GCE is coming from an IOD dark matter, but we would not expect to see one if the GCE is coming from pulsars. Um, and so when we do actually look at the, the various Milky Way doors with the Fermi gamma ray telescope, we don't see any gamma ray flux above the background, and thus we can derive limits on dark matter annihilation from these dwarfs. Um, and interestingly, the limits on, on the dark matter cross-section rule out the parameter space that's preferred by the galactic center. Um, uh, so, so similarly, when the Fermi Space Telescope is pointed away from the galactic center at the isotropic background, there's no excesses seen observed where we see where we know galaxy groups are. So you can similarly derive um, weaker but um, but still interesting limits from stacked galaxy clusters. Um, and further, there's a more tenuous but um, potentially interesting uh, way, way, way to look for, to try to answer this question about whether the GCE is dark matter or pulsars, is to look for, um, I guess, very, um, uh, very, very small differences in the like spatial bin by spatial bin variation of the gamma ray data. Um, so if they are coming from basically a barely unresolved population of pulsars, say like um, 100 to 1,000 of them, then the variation in, in each spatial bin would be greater than you would expect from a smooth profile. And so this has come to be known as a non poissonian template fitting. Um, there are, of course, like a lot of caveats with this kind of thing, because any sort of, um, uh, any sort of um, unresolved, unresolved um, point source population could, uh, I mean, could basically be confused for based, uh, mismodeling of the various extended emissions. Um, but I guess maybe one robust statement to say about this kind of analysis is that in the Fermi, rate, Fermi gamma ray data, there does seem to be some sort of unexplained small scale power. Um, Okay, um, and then I guess for what what I've been doing, what I think is I think the most robust um, uh, line of attack to attack the dark matter interpretation of the GCE is to look more precisely about um, what what the shape of the excess actually is. Um, so basically, when you take a bunch of bold, um, so basically generate a bunch of spatial templates that's motivated from from um, observations of the of um, of the X-ray data, um, simulations of, uh, of, ga of 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 the galaxy bulge. Um, then you can basically generate these um, bulge templates that that actually fit the data better th than an NFW squared template. Um, basically, it fits it so much better that when you try to fit um, allow for both at once, when you include this bulge template and then any additional NFW squared templates, then basically no amount of dark matter um, in, in, is allowed. No amount of dark matter annihilation is allowed when you include these bulge templates. Um, so, so we have, I guess, a basic summary of these two kinds of um, uh, interpretations. Um, and I guess I think the most important one is highlighted here that the fact that um, the the actual data is more consistent with a non-spherical bulge seems to be pointing more towards pulsars. Um, and so, so I guess I want to then and sort of because there's no amount of dark matter basically allowed, then we can derive limits on the dark matter annihilation cross section as a whole. Um, basically, potentially have have, um, have the ability to start ruling out a large a large um, region of WIMP parameter space. Um, so if you do this sort of um, whole template fitting scheme again, but then in this time add in the bulge, the basically the Fermi de um, data is basically fully explained with basically no room for dark matter. Um, so so uh, this is basically just a bunch of math telling about how we're being precise about um, calculating the calculating limits. We're basically calculating it, um, a posterior. Um, we're basically making no specific assumptions about the spectral nature of any of the background stuff, uh, about any of the background templates. Um, so basically, all the energy bins are then independent of each other. Um, so we marginalize over a very, very a basically a very wide space of background models and um, and uh, and spectrum. Um, of course, you need to um, marginalize over uncertainties in the um, uh, in, in the Milky Way's dark matter profile. So basically, marginalizing over the uncertainties in the J factor. Um, and so e even when you're um, accounting for all these uncertainties, you can still um, generate like, these um, relatively robust, I guess, so robust and very, um, very constraints. Um, and what an interesting thing is that when you even um, allow for various non, um, 
very sort of extended ideas about what the, what um, dark matter annihilation signals could look like. Like say, if say dark matter were self-interacting and it had a um, and it had a, had a very had a very chord profile instead of like an NFW profile, or if there were even um, ellipsoidal versions of like NFW or these chord read profiles. Basically, no matter what kind of dark matter or what kind of background you throw at it, basically no amount of dark matter is allowed. Um, when you basically when you include the box when you include these boxy bulges. Um, so yeah, so um, so the point here is just that we really did check a whole bunch of different ideas of, of about what the backgrounds can be, um, and then in and so in in basically all of the cases you derive these sort of strong limits um, that so basically no matter what what you throw at the the problem, um, really no amount of dark matter is preferred by the galactic center. Um, so so here we're just showing that um, in in all the different cases you get these strong limits, um, and then if you take the most conservative. Um, basically draw a line through all of these such that you get the least constraining one, you get a plot that looks like this. Um, Brian, so two minutes left, two minutes sure. left. Um, I maybe need uh, one. Um, so yeah, so the point, so so this is, I guess, the, the, the money plot um, where we've basically derived, where we're basically saying that um, everything below the red line is excluded. And so basically we're excluding, um, uh, I guess, an, an, an basically excluding the existence of WIMP dark matter as being the dark matter candidate for basically masses below um, 500 or so GeV. Um, and yeah, and like I was saying, this is basically robust to basically all the sort of known systematics that you might expect from this from, from this kind of problem. Um, no amount of variation in the, in the various backgrounds, um, no variation in sort of even the, 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 um, the, the template of the dark matter. So, so yeah, so I guess um, I think so the point being that dark, um, dark matters, um, wimp dark matters, I guess, um, on the ropes as it were. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I would be, so yeah, like I would say, um, basically from the GCE data, we show that wimps with masses less than a few hundred TV are rolled out. And so I would then say that um, wimps basically can't be the dark matter. And so the hunt for what actually is a dark matter still continues. Um, thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, thank yes. you for your uh, very interesting talk, but I am afraid this claim that being fit mass less than uh, 300 TV is ruled out is too uh, strong. Suppose being dominantly analyzed to neutrino pair, then these bounds do not apply. Um, so yeah, so I guess, it, it, I guess the, the, the specific annihilation channel does matter. Um, but I mean, so I guess it's all, um, it, I guess it, when, when people were talking about the, um, I, I guess specifically this galactic center excess signal, then um, I guess the, 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 the most likely channels that were going to happen were like were things like BB bar or tau. So I mean, I guess those were what the ones that we highlight the most. I mean, I guess if you look in the actual paper, you can find the specific neutrino one. And yeah, it is different. So so yeah, I guess that is an important caveat. Um, so yeah, thanks. I guess um, thanks for reminding us and everyone. Okay, thank you Ryan for the talk. Let's move on. <clears throat> the next one by David. David Ennis, are you here? Yeah. Okay. One second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Brilliant. Um, okay. Hi, my name is David. Uh, thank you for letting me talk today. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of Göttingen, working with Professor David Marsh. Or, uh, some of you may know him as Doddy Marsh. And I'm working on the formation of axial mini clusters and trying to figure out how we can go about seeing them. So just a quick summary of the background theory. So as some of you may know, the axion has a uh, global U1 symmetry. And there are two different scenarios depending on whether this is broken during or after, uh, during or before inflation or afterwards. If it's broken beforehand, then this value gets stretched out to the size of, it, so it takes on a single value, which gets stretched out to the size of uh, the observable universe. And to calculate the right density, we just have to solve a single ODE. And this is a relatively easy problem that you can do on a laptop. And give uh, to mass students as a homework problem. The second scenario in which it breaks, uh, the symmetry breaks after inflation, um, which is what uh, the, the scenario this, that this talk is about, 
what happens is that the action field takes on random values in size of on, on scales of the Hubble patch. And where these different values meet, we have topological defects such as axiom strings and domain walls. And these are much more difficult to, uh, to evolve, to, cal to calculate. Um, and these are, yeah, uh, heavily impact the, the resulting uh, relic density. And but what's important is that the decay of these objects results in very large amplitude, small scale density perturbations. So we, what we have is very uh, dense, what we call axial mini cluster seeds that later collapse together to form um, axial mini clusters. Okay, so um, so we want to simulate the formation of these using something called peak patch. A peak patch is technically an extended pressure model which solves the excursion set in real space, uh, developed by Dick Bond um, and others. And so, what does that really mean? Well. Where uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Preshector, which works on the power spectrum, Peak Patch, as I said, works on the real density uh, field, real space density field. And so this is our initial condition uh, data produced by Javier Redondo and others. Um, again, by solving the, the full evolution of the axiom strings, uh, et cetera. And one consequence of this is that while Preshector is purely statistical, Peak Patch can track individual over densities for. Um, yeah, can track these individual evidences and therefore calculate a mass and final position for them that relates to what you would find with n body. Additionally, where pressure only captures, it assumes Gaussianity, it therefore only captures Gaussian evolution, it therefore loses some of the information about these very rare high evidences, whereas with peak patch, uh, we capture that fully. And um, so it should also say that it's, this is orders of magnitude faster than running full n body calculations. Um, and so we've done this. On some, on some, on these axial mini cluster initial conditions, and yeah, we can calculate the Halo mass functions for these. So here we have our, uh, some of our results. So the solid lines now are our results using peak patch. The dashed lines are n body results on the same data produced by Benedict Gegmeier uh, et al. And this is, yeah, like I say, on the exact same initial conditions. One thing to point out is that. While we chose a specific axion mass, all, most of these results within some mass range can be essentially just shifted in, in the mass direction by considering a different axion mass because the mass of the objects is, goes like one over the square root of m. So this is quite nice, but um, for, the, we could, we, for the most part could have done this, particularly later at shifts using Preshekta. What's more interesting now is trying to predict the concentrations of these objects using uh, peak patch. So, so the axiom mini clusters are known to have a NFW profile and therefore they have a concentration. And this has been known for a while, the concentration of a halo is somehow dependent on the redshift to which it's collapsed. And I have collapsed in quotations here. What does that really mean? Well, on the far Frank and White consider this to be the point at which half of the halo's final mass is contained within progenitors of a mass larger than some fraction of that final. And they, they said that the scale density of your NFW profile is proportional to the density of the universe at this time of collapse up to some constant proportionality. Well, because peak patch, we can run peak patch, um, because it's, it's, it takes so little time to run and we can generate many, many snapshots because the data, uh, the data output is so much smaller than N body, we can calculate the collapse redshifts for many, many halos. We do this by building up merge trees that look like this. So for each of our final halos, we can iteratively look inside them at earlier redshifts and therefore calculate the collapse redshift. Um, but there's uh, one more piece to this puzzle, and that is, I said, this constant proportionality. Um, unfortunately, we this isn't something we can calculate with peak patch. So we have to normalize to n-body results. And so again, we use the results of Benedict Egemeyer cell and we fit our, our uh, concentration mass curves to, to that. And we generate this singular line by essentially taking a somewhat pressure style calculation um, for the purpose of fitting our, our model. I should say that these three uh, points uh, each relate to many, many halos and not just individual uh, axion mini clusters. So for them, once we've calculated this value uh, kappa, we can then apply that to our peak patch results. And, uh, and then we can get a full concentration mass distribution of axiom mini clusters. So we see that we have roughly the same shape with some uh, peak 
uh, at around 10 to the minus 13. And these, uh, yeah, agree fairly well with the, with the end body results. What's quite nice now is that for very high concentrations, so long as your redshift collapse doesn't change too much, which we don't think it should, the concentration essentially just grows as the scale factor. So the last snapshot in the end body data is uh, redshift of 99 because you start to run into uh, nonlinear effects there. Um, we can still evolve this to uh, sort of our projector line to today by just scaling it with a, the scale factor. And we see that we get concentrations of around 10 to the five, which is, as you may know, many orders of magnitude uh, more dense than say the Milky Way. Um, okay, and so now we want to think about well, how can we go about finding them? So we know they're very dense. There's a lot of literature about how to find a, another type of dense uh, dark matter candidate. It's primarily all black holes, and it's typically, we often think about doing that with microlensing. And what is microlensing? It's essentially just the same as regular gravitational lensing that we think of, but we typically now just have one light source and we can't resolve the separate images. So does that look like? Well, we see in this animation here that when objects pass between us and some objects, a, a star, we can see, uh, sometimes we'll be able to see a brief amplification of, of the light of this object. And therefore we can infer the presence of these, uh, of these objects. But as is illustrated in this animation, uh, mini clusters aren't actually point masses. They, and therefore they have a much smaller threshold impact parameter. And as we can see from this integral, we, so we can uh, predict the number of lensing events, which has some integral over the, uh, the impact parameters that do produce lensing. And therefore, by, because this impact, this, this threshold impact parameter is lower for basically fluffier objects, we therefore the lensing rate is, is lower. So what we can do is we can essentially map on our results for um, axial mini clusters to peak, uh, primordial black holes primordial by black calculating holes. the ratio of the, uh, this effective impact parameter with the Einstein radius. And so we did do that exactly here. So that in where it's very uh, dark blue, they lens very much like point masses. Uh, but after you get to uh, these these lower concentrations, you don't get any lensing at all. And this is because basically the the area of your um, density profile that's doing the lensing is now in the r to the minus one region. So it's that part that kills you. Now. Where do our previous results lie on this graph? Well, it's probably not a good sign that I've left so much white space down here because this is where these maximum concentrations, so these concentrations that uh, reach up to zero uh, that we predicted lie. Now we can go about trying, to, but this is only uh, sort of the average line. We can estimate the maximum possible concentration and to have time to talk, go through too much about how we uh, do that, but that. Um, but we predict that the maximum possible concentration that NFW uh, mini clusters can have would lie somewhere around here. So we see there's still a lot of distance between uh, this and the, the potentially lensing area, but it does get worse because of wave effects. So as you may know, wave effects mean that primordial black holes are unconstrained for un below masses of around 10 to the minus 12 solar masses. Thus that's worse because we have to consider the smaller effective lensing area. And so really our objects have to be above, the, above this uh, red line, dashed line here. So, was this the last? Two hmm? minutes left. Two, two minutes, minutes left? I thought I only had 10 minutes. Okay, I'm nearly done. Um, so, is this the last hope for uh, axial lensing with axial mini clusters? Well, no, fortunately, there, there is another. And that's because we know that axial mini clusters have a very dense, uh, very rich uh, substructure. So, up to this point, we've assumed that axiom mini clusters are always NFW. Uh, they, they always produce NFW profiles, but the substructure that, that forms from these very early forming axiom mini cluster seeds um, may be distinctly different from that. Specifically, uh, it's been shown in the literature before that if you have an object that forms by a self semi collapse um, that just accretes from the background, uh, it may instead have a power law profile of nine to the minus four. And as I said before, it's the part that the, with the NFW profile, it's the part that goes like R to the minus one that kills your, your ability to lens. But with the power, but with a steeper power law, there's always some smaller effective uh, radius for which you are able to lens. Um, so even though your ability to lens will be suppressed, it doesn't go away entirely. So 
yeah, um, I've maybe cut out a little bit too much because I thought I only had 10 minutes, but that is everything. Uh, thank you. I guess more time for questions if there are any. Thank you. Sorry, I, sh I should say, um, yeah, so trying to figure out whether these these objects lens and what they look like is this the next stages of, of uh, my work. <laughs> Thank you. So, any questions? So, I may have one question. So, you compare the results with the embody simulation. Does uh, such a simulation depend on the uh, assumption of the dark matter properties like the wind or anything else? Um, no, uh, this, so it's just uh, essentially a cold dark matter. I can be honest. Uh, it's essentially a uh, cold dark matter simulation, but um, using these the same initial conditions. So you have very high over densities, which mean that uh, objects start to collapse very early into the uh, radiation dominated era. And that's the main difference with to ordinary WIMP simulations. Um, and so you, you just you get much denser objects, but the specific properties of the particles are yeah, the same as what as you would use for ordinary cold dark matter. Does that answer your question? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, basically for this uh, axion dark matter, so um, do, do they have the same uh, structure formation history with uh, such kind of other kind of cold dark matter? Um, so, so with the, um, in the mini cluster scenario, you get objects forming much, much earlier. So as I can show, if I go back to the, uh, and the mass function, uh, right? Yeah, we see that um, well before matter radiation equality, so we have these very early redshifts, we have objects forming. And for ordinary cold dark matter, I think that typically isn't the case, um, unless you have some yeah, compact object um, scenarios in which they have a peak in the initial power spectrum, something, which is actually somewhat similar to this. So that's, that's the main difference. Okay. Okay, thank you. So let's move to the last one of our session by um, Mohammed, Mohammed Shar. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, do you have my screen? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mohammed Sharifian. Uh, our work, uh, our recent work is uh, probing virtual axion-like particles by precision phase measurements. And uh, we use time varying magnetic field background. Um, okay. Uh, there were many efforts for uh, detecting axion-like particles. Um, I showed some of them here. Um, and uh, the, many of them use uh, the interaction of axion-like particle and axion with photons uh, to detect and uh, to show the presence of the Alps and uh, axions. This is the abstract result of uh, their efforts, and the famous efforts. There are many works, but uh, I showed some of them here. Recently, um, there are efforts by uh, cavities uh, and people use cavities, optical cavities, to show the presence of uh, axion-like particles and axions. And uh, some people used bow-tie cavity, and uh, they showed that the uh, presence of axion causes uh, a, a phase difference, a phase velocity difference between uh, right-handed and left-handed photons in a cavity. And they uh, wanted to show the presence of uh, the uh, axion or axion-like particle by um, this, uh, by showing this difference phase velocity. Another work is on uh, is uh, on the showing that uh, there is side bands uh, near the carrier frequency of the pumped photon, pumped laser photon inside the cavity. And uh, this is uh, an effort to uh, show the presence of axion-like particle by the cavity. Uh, another work is uh, uh, by Muslim Zari that 
they wanted to, and his co-workers, they wanted to show the presence of uh, the axon-like particle by uh, showing that uh, using a, a space periodic magnetic field will cause um, an enhancement in the phase devi deviation of the photon inside the cavity. And they detect this phase deviation uh, and um, uh, by the reference photon, which is in pumped laser. And uh, they wanted to show that this phase deviation is because of the presence of axion-like particles and axions. Our work is um, uh, a continuum of uh, the uh, previous work of Muslim Zari. And uh, we used a periodic magnetic field and we showed that, uh, we want to show that what is the effect of using a periodic uh, magnetic field, a time dependent magnetic field on the phase deviation of photon inside the cavity. Using the famous uh, interaction Lagrangian of the uh, axion and photon, axion like particles and photons, and uh, separating the F mu nu uh, into a homogeneous background that is uh, F bar mu nu and the fluctuating part D rho A sigma. Uh, and writing the second order S matrix and also based on Feynman diagrams, uh, we can have the effective Hamiltonian of the interaction of axions and axion-like particles with photons. We have here some integrals on uh, x prime, x, and also uh, on uh, k uh, in, the, uh, in this Feynman propagator. If we take these integrals, finally, we have this integral under, uh, under uh, cos, uh, cos zero, and uh, we will have the Hamiltonian uh, interaction effective Hamiltonian like this. And uh, we will use these two inner products later. Also, integrating over T prime over the time will cause uh, four sync functions like this. These are four sharp sync functions and they are like delta functions. And uh, these are because of the uh, time dependency of the magnetic field. This is the schematic of um, our proposal. Um, as you can see here, uh, we have uh, we have used the uh, we have used two photons inside the cavity. One of them is perpendicular to the magnetic field, and the other is in the direction of magnetic field. And as we as you can see here, the inner product causes uh, that the perpendicular uh, polarizations, the uh, photons with perpendicular polarization, will be intact, and we can use this uh, perpendicular polarization as a uh, reference. And um, the maximum interaction is with the uh, uh, polarization, which is in the direction of magnetic field. And, and the benefit of uh, using, this, um, um, using this way is that both polarizations will uh, sense the same noise inside the cavity. And um, this suppresses the uh, noise effects of our scheme. Using the Landering Heisenberg equations uh, for the time evolution of photon inside the cavity and uh, um, comparing the uh, phase, the uh, induced phase of the uh, interaction Hamiltonian on the photon, on the photon which is in the direction of magnetic field uh, and comparing the phase um, um, with the minimum phase that we can detect uh, by the quantum measurement, we can, uh, we can show that uh, the axion-like particle uh, does exist or not. This equation shows the
Muhammad. Are you still online? Just 